Uh, I don't know uh, whether you know anything about my stuff. I, I'm a expert in the erosion in the Western Himalaya and the Hindu Kush in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got started in that way back in the early 1970s mm -hmm. when the United Nations talked to me about uh, was I inter because I was on an expedition with one one of the UN guys up in the Arctic, and they asked me uh, was I interested because they knew I had a I'd been to Afghanistan in the early 60s in the early 70s, and that I might have connections over there. And so to make a really long story short, uh, I got involved with the U.S. Geological Survey, NSF, Smithsonian, I don't know a whole bunch of places who funded me in uh, mainly on glaciers in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And then when things got a little bit sticky politically, I had enough connections with the U.S. Embassy to uh, get into all kinds of places which surprised people uh, across borders. And I ultimately ended up uh, giving a lot of talks in, in Kathmandu. Yeah, so I was born in Kathmandu, Nepal, and I, um, I did my schooling in Darjeeling, well, in Kalimpong, which is in, um, in India, so Northeast India. Yep, yep. And then um, I came back to Kathmandu because my parents lived there, finished my um, high school there, and then I applied uh, to go to the United States for, you know, undergraduate, and I actually ended up at Union College in upstate New York. So, yeah. And Union? Yeah, Union. <laughs> And it's connected me? Yes, it's connected me. That's my alma mater. I graduated from there in 1961. Oh, no way. Class of 2018. Long time before you were born. Yeah, geology at Union. So you're yeah. a graduate of there? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Well, that's that's cool. That's cool. Totally. Yeah. And so you graduated from there. Uh, and then you went on from there to Arizona? Yeah, so after I graduated from Union, um, I knew that I kind of wanted to do research and um, specifically, you know, research that dealt with tectonics in the Nepalese Himalaya. So um, I ended up applying to the University of Arizona for my uh, for a master's. And um, yeah, so I came here to Tucson two years ago and transitioned into a PhD right after. Out outstanding. Well, there are connections. I mean, I've I've been in Kathmandu gazillions of times, mm -hmm. mostly. You know, Isamad. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah my dad well, works there. They've had me there numerous times, so I know your turf. I've not been over where you're uh, doing your study. Is that the Arun Valley? No. So, so I am currently for the Zayas project. I'm currently working um, in western Nepalese Himalaya, so that's all yep. the way to the west. Um, but I'm also hoping to do some more uh, research along strike in Eastern Nepal as well. Doing field work where you're doing it is fantastic. I know mm -hmm. a little bit about uh, the thrust stuff in your area and a little bit about the intrusive history. Not a lot uh, by no means, but you've got a really interesting project. Yeah, so I think um, I was applying to this, uh, to this ICE GSA grant when uh, I was in the second year of my master's program. So I was just finishing with my master's thesis um, and I knew that I wanted to do a PhD. So I was kind of um, exploring um, research options that I could pursue for my PhD. And my advisor actually, he, um, he, he let me know about the grant and I looked into it. And it, at that time I was thinking of sort of expanding from uh, what I was already doing, which was thermal chronology into something um, something different, um, and I've been reading papers on monozyclic chronology, which, like I said, again, combines uh, geochronology with uh, geochemical analysis to uh, inform the tectonic histories of rocks. So I thought it'd be cool to apply that to uh, our study site in Western Nepal, where we'd already been. And the only problem was that we didn't really have funding to actually do any of the analysis yet. And uh, since it was so early on and, you know, uh, I was still in my master's kind of in the weird transitioning between master's and PhD, didn't really have funding. So uh, at that point, uh, having this financial support was really um, helpful 
it kind of reduced some of the uncertainty that was already there. Um, and especially when it came to COVID, um, there was a huge uncertainty with what, was, what would be possible to do in my PhD research. Um, and I think that was one of the additional um, uh, things that really was great about the grant was I had access to all these uh, lab facilities through Zeiss. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to visit due to uh, the current pandemic situation, but I was still able to uh, uh, work with representatives from size and have them um, have a conversation where we could, uh, where I could ship off my samples to them and they could help me with working on them. So it really was great because, you know, a lot of the labs had, were either at least in-house in the University of Arizona, they were either closed or they were, um, they were uh, not functioning as, as um, heavily as we would in normal conditions. So I, I wasn't in lab as uh, much as I would have liked to. So it was great that I had these other, op these other options or these other um, facilities that I could use. I've shipped uh, some of my samples to size facilities in Vienna, Germany, and they're digitizing the, so these are some thin section samples of uh, thin section samples of my rocks and they're digitizing it um, to make it available to me so that I can, you know, look at the uh, texture, texture relationships of minerals in thin section as well as the mineral assemblages um, to just my computer. I don't have to go into lab, which is great because again, you know, it doesn't mean that I have to be in person in lab when I'm doing that. And honestly, the the financial help has been like has been great. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to visit the labs as well and see how, uh, see all the instruments that they're using. Um, yeah. I I'm going to add in here that uh, one of the things that I never learned at all from my any of my professors was getting grants. And it was only uh, much later when I was already a professor. And I really, and so teaching graduate students the importance of being able to formulate good ideas, uh, you use equipment like you're going to get from Zeiss and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and then planning for the future of your own grant grant streams and your own research threads with a company like Zeiss and with the facilities that they're going to give you, that's fairly fantastic. And that'll enable you to go really anywhere you want uh, in your research and in fact, physically in the world, uh, that, that speaks a lot. So getting involved at that level uh getting a, a help from gsa at first and then later on to all the other granting agencies that's fairly fantastic uh what kind of uh obstructions have you found or just general problems that you might have run into i, I guess more than problems it's just sort of the um uh, you know growing up in nepal like we didn't really have uh woman leading uh, fieldwork expeditions or doing scientific research. At least I didn't grow up seeing that um, or seeing that kind of visual representation. So I think, you know, like growing up, uh, that was a big absence. And um, when I actually started doing research, I kind of understood the importance of having that visibility, of having that representation. Just in general, being able to do the do this kind of research, um, especially involving field work, lots of time out in you know rural um, areas, is kind of empowering to me, and also um, you know kind of inspiring to myself and hopefully to others as well. What is your uh, specialty in geology? So uh, my specialty is um, for now. It's right now. It's uh, thermochronology, which is looking at the thermal history of rocks. Um, and right now I'm transitioning, like I said, uh, as I'm going from my master's to my PhD, I'm more getting more interested in the field of metamorphic petrology and using these new methods like petrochronology, which um, incorporates both uh, geochronology and geochemical analysis to sort of give you an idea about the, uh, 
the way that these the way that rocks have evolved through time. So Super. I guess my yeah my speciality is more uh, using these decorative methods to create a story about the tectonic history of the rocks. Super, super. That. What are your plans? I mean, get your PhD first. What direction do you think you want to go in after you finish your doctorate? I'm leaning more towards um, an academic career, um, but obviously, I'm still in my first year of my PhD, so I feel like you know. Yeah, uh, but you know, it, you know, I actually didn't have any plans. I was just willy nilly going along, getting educated. And I, I sort of woke up with a PhD one day and I said, what do I do now? And one of the profs said, well, you could go for work for an oil company or you could go in academia. And I thought, well, academia sounds kind of kind of fun because that's what I've been doing. Whichever, you know, wherever I go, I feel like uh, I feel like being involved with education in Nepal and having these outreach activities in Nepal will always be a big part of uh, what I do. So I think that's always going to be there. But um, whether I'm going to be primarily teaching there or here is, you know, we'll see in the future. <laughs> well, you'll, you'll cer certainly be highly qualified to do either one. And mm -hmm. there's, there's such great interest in Nepal. It's such a neat place. Uh, of course, I love the mountains. And, uh, and the geology is superb. I mean, it's one of the most interesting places the whole Himalaya chain and the Hindu Kush chain are fascinating places. Uh, how many languages do you speak? Um, I speak uh, Nepali, um, Hindi, and English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you can work virtually uh, the length and breadth of that range and uh, do lots of cool stuff. Being able to communicate with the people from back home in Nepal or India and being able to make uh, the research that we do accessible to everyone is kind of one of the um, kind of one of the privileges that I have, you know, is that I can I can understand what I the research that I'm doing and make it ready readily accessible for everyone. I think um, I think that there's a disconnect uh, that I also feel when I go back home, the disconnect between the sciences and the communities. Um, the local community especially and it doesn't have to do with just uh, you know tectonics or just geology just in general um, the sciences in general I think there's a huge disconnect so, um, yeah that's another thing is you know I'm always I've always been very interested in science communication and being, um, having these outreach activities so hopefully in the future I can continue to build on those yeah that that's great yeah uh, I've been with a number of other top scientists and some, one of them in particular i will mention no names but he couldn't uh translate uh what we were doing into sort of normal english well i said but you got to communicate it to people that don't speak your language and your scientific language basically to communicate how cool your science is uh without going into your jargon that's the hard thing to do. Uh, you have to figure out uh, words that people will understand who are not scientists. And then uh, the other thing to do is to, of course, communicate how cool it is that we understand all of these things, that we're, we're getting better understandings. Uh, and I, I'm a, a been extremely enthusiastic about uh, working in the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush. To me, that was like the best thing I ever did and for sure it was actually really the best thing I ever did, but it's just neat to be able to communicate that to people. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, your parents or your family or just local people to communicate how neat that is, that's that's good if you, and if you're thinking that way already at this stage, that's excellent because mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think that way at all when I was young. I didn't know enough to even think about that. So yeah, good good for you. Yeah, I think it's like especially apparent when um, when you're doing field work. And um, so when I was in Nepal um, for my last field season, uh, we were doing a transect and along the river, and we had like local children because you know it, it's usually afternoons. They have a few times. They're running around. They see you. They come. They're curious. They want to know because like children, they're so curious. They want to know everything. 
So they would come up to us and they would ask us what we were doing. And, you know, um, the fact that I could talk, talk to them in a poly, like, and sort of explain what I was doing, uh, looking at the, uh, you know, looking at the orientation of the rocks or little things like that was very um, satisfying. It was, it was very, uh, you know, satisfying in the sense that when I was growing up, I always had these questions about the mountains, like how they form and, you know, so having someone like that, like kind of explain things to me would have been really cool. So yeah, I think about that and I think about how that will hopefully encourage them and maybe in a way um, inspire them to continue on learning. So good luck to you. Thank you.